webinar or one of the other earlier ones that we had um, a couple weeks ago or th over the past couple weeks, uh, you'll have that available to you as well. And if you have a desire to, for the slides as well, we can send that to you as well. Um, so to start things off, though, I want to introduce uh, Lisa Robin. She is the Chief Advocacy Officer for the Federation of State Medical Boards. Lisa. Thank you, Carl, um, and welcome to the third in the CSG's webinar series to explain the PA licensure compact and answer your questions. Uh, this project is supported from funding through the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration License Portability Grant Program, and I'd like to recognize our partner organizations, and that's the CSG's National Center for Interstate Compacts, the American Academy of PAs, and the National Commission for Certification of Physician Assistants. This um, project really began in 2019 with a grant um, from, uh, from a, as I mentioned earlier, a grant from HRSA that has uh, earlier has also supported the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. We began with a meeting in November of 2019 and brought regulators together in DC at the Hall of States where CSG has an office. And we had presentations from all of the various compacts, the PT compact, the IMLC, the nursing compact, and others. And just to look at the various models that were out there, uh, we had planned a meeting for the spring of 20, and yes, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and things were delayed somewhat. But we were able to uh, continue discussions and taking the notes from the first meeting uh, had a, a, a compact draft legislation that was distributed to the regulatory boards in spring of 21. And we did receive some comments back. After that time, there was uh, several meetings um, <clears throat> to, to massage the, the compact legislation and then again had a meeting of regulators again in Washington, DC in November of 21. So uh, with that, that's kind of the history of the, of the compact. I will turn it over to Carl, thank you. All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, so to start things off, we first just want to provide a bit of an introduction to who we are at CSG, if you're unfamiliar with us. So um, CSG is a nonpartisan uh, membership organization that serves the three branches of state government. So we're there uh, to help states by uh, sharing policy options that are available to them to help convene and, and promote dialogue across the state so they can share what works, engage with the research, and find out what other states are doing. Uh, next slide, please. As part of our work, we have a technical assistance center called the National Center for Interstate Compacts, which was started back in 2004. And with that center, we help states by providing them education services about interstate compacts, help with the development of new interstate compacts, and then also assist with the administration of those that are already in existence there. So we wanna be there as a clearinghouse for states to find out more information, as well as ways that they can engage more particularly with compacts as a tool to state cooperation. Next slide, please. And so specifically, and the reason for today's webinar, of course, is looking over the PA licensure compact. Next slide. Uh, but before we get into the specifics of the PA compact, we first just wanted to better make you familiar with what it is an interstate compact, um, if you weren't aware before. And so interstate compact is quite simply a legal agreement between two or more states that's enacted by legislation that lets them sh cooperatively address a shared problem. Um, one of the most common examples um, for someone to think about uh, interstate compact is your driver's license. So your ability to use your driver's license from your home state and be able to drive in um, an adjoining state or really any state uh, is thanks to interstate compact, an agreement between states to recognize those licenses issued by other states uh, to use uh, roadways outside of where you live. Um, and so you can think of interstate compacts, though, as a way to solve really any policy area of which there's a need for states to come together and um, collectively um, share their resources, share their thoughts, um, and through legislation come together to uh, find a solution for a certain policy problem. Next slide, please. One of the most trending forms of interstate compacts were the policy areas that pertaining to them is occupational licensure. So states have been forming these and utilizing them as a way to facilitate multi-state practice, to help 
promote public health and safety and preserve their authority over professional licensing. So you can see here listed some of the numbers about state enactment. Uh, I want to highlight specifically that there are currently nine professions that have interstate compacts um, that are available. That number is increasing this year, inclusive of the PA compact with several others on the way. They are formed per profession because they're unique to the needs of the profession, as you'll see with some of the details in the PA licensure compact. Um, as far as the prevalence of them across states, um, you'll see here since January of 2016, there's been over 230 pieces of occupational licensure compact legislation passed among the states, and we certainly expect that to increase over the course of 2023 sessions. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the PA licensure compact, as it is similar to other licensure compacts, is to facilitate multi-state practice. Uh, specifically with PAs, um, there's an agreement of a standard, certain standards of practice that states are agreeing to with that compact language that each state is agreeing to equally. Um, it's also a way to support military families more specifically. So in addition to PAs um, who um, are just wishing to practice across state lines, there are certain populations that may be um, moving more frequently than others, such as those in the military. So it's a way to further support them and align with other state goals. It also helps promote cooperation amongst states that have joined the or will be joining the PA licensure compacts in areas of regulation. So in addition to um, agreeing upon the um, model language of the compact, there is the formation of a compact commission comprised of those states joining the compact as a way to further regulate from the provisions authorized to it by the compact. And then with, and we'll go into this in detail later on, the creation of a licensure database, there's a higher degree of patient protection with shared information about disciplinary matters uh, pertaining to the uh, authorization granted by the compact. Next slide, please. I wanna also at the top here list some reminders for licensing boards uh, that with a state joining a compact, there's some certain things to keep in mind. One the state retains control over their initial licensure process, and they receive access to that compact data system that allows them to um, access information pertaining to those who have a compact privilege, and we'll go through that process in detail. Um, you'll also be receiving support from other compact member states in the form of sharing information through that data system, and you'll be participating in the PA Compact Commission by assigning a delegate who will be um, working with fellow delegates on issuing rules and the administration of the compact at large. Licensing boards will also have the ability to charge a fee for a compact privilege as well as the renewal of that privilege. Next slide, please. So here's some key definitions uh, that were pulled directly from the model legislation, just because we'll be using these more frequently throughout today's presentation. So we wanted to have these spelled out here to you in writing. Um, but starting with the first one here, when we talk about participating state, that just means any state that's participating in the compact that has enacted that compact through legislation. When we talk about a remote state, that is a participating state, but in reference to one where a PA is exercising compact privilege, um, where they have a qualifying license, but they're using the compact to get a compact privilege, authorizing them to practice in another state through the compact. So that remote state being that additional state that now they'll be practicing in. Qualifying license just means that unrestricted license that's the basis for a PA to be able to participate in the compact. There'll be some other individual requirements in addition to that, uh, but that's the primary vehicle by which a, a PA will be able to apply for a compact privilege, which you'll see here listed in the definition is simply the authorization granted by a remote state, again, a participating state in the compact uh, to allow them to practice through the provisions of the compact. Important to underline here that with a PA utilizing a compact privilege, they are um, under the laws and regulations of the remote state. So the, um, the, the, the laws and regulations they'll be following is where the care is being delivered. So that's important to note throughout our conversations. Next slide, please. So let's go at a high level about how exactly the PA compact works. So licensure compacts at large uh, function a little bit differently from compact to compact. And again, that's because each is created specific to the needs of the profession and the existing regulatory framework that exists there. 
the PA Compact utilizes a mutual recognition model. We'll have some comparison between the different models of other compacts that you might be more familiar with, such as the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, um, but simply with the mutual recognition model that's um, a way through the compact for states to recognize an existing unrestricted license. And then through a compact privilege, again, that authorization to practice being granted the authorization to extend itself to remote states through the compact commission itself. So the compact privilege, again, underlining here, it provides the same benefits as licensure. Next slide, please. Here are a few notes to kind of underscore about compact privileges. Uh, one, whenever a PA utilizing the compact, when they're applying for compact privilege, they'll be doing so for each remote state of which they want to practice. They also may be a fee that may be issued by not just the commission, but also the remote state of which they're applying for a compact privilege. And then compact privileges expire when the qualifying license expires, so that renewal is tied to that. And then, um, as stated before, with the PA using their compact privilege, they must follow the laws and regulations of the state in which they're practicing. This includes itself to things like prescription of medicine, um, but really um, anything. Um, the, the, the compact privilege is really getting you into the state, but again, following the state's laws and regulations, there's a lot of other things that the PA will have to adhere to in order to practice and be in compliance with the law. Next slide, please. So here is a simple comparison uh, between uh, different compacts that are in existence. Um, so you'll see here uh, we have the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact and then the APRN Compact as well. So there's some similarities here requiring the uh, practitioner to have a single state license um, that's unrestricted, but there's different models for which the um, practitioner is able to utilize the compact. So for IMLC, the accepted applicants, for example, will receive a letter of qualification from the state of principal licensure in order to facilitate through an expedited licensure model, um, licensure in full in a different participating state. There are fees that are charged upon application for that compact, um, uh, for that license in other states. Going over here to the far end with APRN, that works most similarly to your driver's license. So the driver's license model that we mentioned, we're able to have a multi-state license, and that is able to get you into any state of which is participating in the compact, but just having that multi-state license works for all. The PA compact falls here in the middle. Again, I won't go through it in detail. Um, again, on the on the process here, but again, applying for each state that we should practice, that compact privilege, providing authorization for each state, and then fees being associated with the uh, provisions associated with all these compacts. On the next slide, we'll have a, another look at these models just to provide you a little bit more detail on the different steps that are involved with each. Again, we're showing this to you just to compare and contrast those different models that may be out there, uh, particularly if you might be more, more familiar with uh, compacts such as IMLC. Important to underscore here is that that data system helps facilitate that information be communicated across the states that are participating in the compact. Next slide, please. And from here, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Grant Minix. Grant? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Carl. And um, here we're going to go over a few of the provisions which respect the laws and regulations of each individual state. Um, <clears throat> on the left here, we'll see we have a list of just some basic things that states can do in order to protect um, their laws and regulations and, and, and improve state sovereignty. Um, on that, the first one you see here on this left uh, category, it's states can investigate compact privilege holders for action which is taken within their state. Um, you know, states you know don't lose that right to be able to take action, uh, no matter uh, you know which state a uh, compact privilege holder uh, is from. As long as that action is taken in their state, they have the ability to act on that. Uh, they can also act on a license or privilege which is issued by their state. Um, this doesn't just, as you can see, doesn't just apply to the license, but uh, if they if they're to issue a, uh, a privilege to an individual, that privilege is not just uh, acted upon by the state which issues it. They can act on that privilege, just solely that privilege as well. Um, they can also participate in joint investigations with other member states if they so feel the need to. Um, 
And here on the right, we're going to see a list of things that states can't do that it, it helps protect state sovereignty. Um, the first is act on a license or privilege, which is issued by another member state. Uh, you, you know, if you a good way to keep keep it in mind is just you can act on the license, act on the privilege, which your state issues, not another state. Uh, states also cannot deny a privilege or investigate a PA for lawful action, which is in another state. So if you know, a, a PA performs action in one state, which follows the laws and regulations of that state, but say maybe it doesn't in another state, that state, which it doesn't, can't take action on that because it was legally done in, in that other state. They also cannot specify the laws and regulations a PA must follow when they're practicing in a remote state. And, you know, that always uh, it ties into this bottom note we have here. And Carl's touched on this a couple times already, but uh, something very important to kind of hammer home is that the PA, comp that PA compact privilege holders, you must always abide by the laws and regulations of the state which they're practicing in at the, at the time. And I kind of think of it uh, like, like your driver's license. I can't, uh, I have to follow the laws of the road um, in the state I'm driving in. I can't go take Kentucky speed limits and, and, and use them in Ohio. Um, just the same way that this, that the PA compact privilege holder uh must follow by the laws and regulations of the state they're in. Um, a few things that we wanted to point out in particular, uh, in ways in which states maintain their uh, regulation over the profession. And, and that's, you know, one of the big ones is supervising physician requirements. We know these differ slightly between states, um, but, but that responsibility is going to be on the PA to, to meet those requirements in every state they wish to practice in. Um, also, title changes that that'll be left up to the state and and how they and, and their laws and regulations regarding title changes. Uh, and then finally, prescribing authority, which I think Carl touched on earlier. Uh, that that that's also a, an area in which must be followed, uh, depending on the state the PA is practicing in. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, state requirements versus individual requirements. So if if you guys have read through. The PA compact, you'll see that there's a section which consists of requirements that states must have in place in order for them to utilize the compact. And uh, this section also includes specific requirements for the state to follow regarding maintenance of the compact. You'll see that state requirements section, uh, if you've got the compact in front of you in section three. Uh, then that next section is section four, which consists of the individual requirements. Um, these are requirements a licensee must have completed prior to being issued a compact privilege. So before they can get that privilege to practice in another state, um, they, they must have met these requirements. And this, this section also includes some automatic disqualifiers, which can prohibit individuals from obtaining that privilege. Uh, so we're going to move on and jump right into some of these state requirements. Um, in the, the first one, a member state must, must license PAs. Uh, they must also participate in the Compact Commission's data system, which we said, you know, goes to, goes, that is what, you know, facilitates mobility between states. They must participate in that in order to maintain their membership in the Compact. They must also have a mechanism in place for receiving and investigating complaints against licensees and licensed applicants. Uh, they must notify the Commission of any adverse action against or significant investigative information of a licensee or licensed applicant. Um, and then they must also fully implement a criminal background check requirement. As we can see through a lot of these requirements, many of them are there just in place for, uh, you know, public protection to ensure that we have a, a baseline set of requirements, which all states recognize. Uh, a few more of the state requirements here. A uh, member state must comply with the rules of the Compact Commission, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but in essence, that's a, that's a group of representatives from, from each state which comes together to, to generate rules for the compact. A state must also utilize passage of a re recognized national exam, such as the NCCPA pants, as a requirement for PA licensure. And then uh, the state must grant the compact privilege, grant the compact privilege to a holder of a qualifying license in another state, which is participating in the compact. That can, can, gives them that obligation to, to, to ensure that privileges are granted by each state. So now we'll jump into some of the individual requirements uh, in order to obtain a compact privilege and be able to practice in other states. 
Uh, keep in mind, none of these requirements have anything to do with the single state license uh, in, a, in an individual state, just, just what they have to do in order to obtain that privilege. Uh, so, so to be able to exercise the privilege, the licensee must have graduated from an accredited PA program, um, must currently hold NCCPA certification, uh, have no felony or misdemeanor convictions, uh, never had a controlled substance license or permit suspended or revoked, and then they must also uh, have a unique identifier as determined by the compact commission, which they'll, uh, once that commission stand up, they'll, they'll set the requirement for that what that identifying number is. A few more individual requirements here. Uh, the PA must hold an unrestricted license, which is issued by a participating compact state um, to provide medical services as a PA. Uh, they must have no limitation or restriction on any license or compact privilege in the previous two years. They must notify the compact commission of their intent to seek uh, a privilege in a remote state. Uh, they must meet any jurisprudence requirements in that remote state and then pay any fees that are necessary in order to obtain that privilege. And then, you know, for, for any adverse action which is taken against them by a non-member state, they must report that to the commission within 30 days after the action is taken. So here we're going to jump into uh, just a good, we have a good visual here of how that qualifying license that you obtain in your primary state how that qualifying license is kind of your ticket uh, to obtaining compact privileges in other states. You'll see here, once you obtain that qualifying license um, and you want to seek privileges in, in state A, state B, state C, three different states, uh, you know, if those states are members of the compact, you can go obtain privileges in each of those three states uh, and, and be able to practice there, which would give you, you know, as you can see here, the ability to practice in four different states uh, considering you have that qualifying license and then privileges in three other states. So let's say maybe I do something in state A, which uh, is against the rules of that state. I didn't follow the laws and regulations of that state. They took action upon me and I've lost my compact privilege. Uh, well, you know, if if what they did in state A was still fit fits within the laws and regulations of the primary state, as well as, you know, state B and state C, they can still practice in their primary state along with those two other states um, because no action was, was taken against those privileges or the qualifying license overall. They would just lose, simply lose your ability to practice in, in one state. But now let's say maybe uh, I did something in my primary state which they took action against or uh, possibly I didn't you know, renew uh, that, that qualifying license. That's going to take away my qualifying license. And once that's done, uh, I'm going to lose all of my compact privileges. I'm going to lose the ability to practice in state A, state B, and state C nearly simultaneously. Because uh, as you can see, that qualifying license is your ticket uh, to being able to obtain and maintain uh, compact privileges in each of the states in which you have privileges for. So now we'll get into a bit of the, with the PA Compact Commission, uh, which we touched on earlier, but uh, to to kind of sum up this group a little better, uh, the PA Compact Commission it will consist of one delegate from each state. That representative, you know, in the compact, we set out just a criteria for that for that representative. And uh, um, in the compact, it lays out that that representative must be a current PA, physician, or public member uh, of a licensing board or PA council or committee, or they could just they could be an administrator of the licensing board. So here you'll see, uh, as we begin to wrap up, a few additional resources um, which are available to you all as uh, the PA Compact becomes uh, brought up and discussed in your state. So uh, we have our website there, uh, www.pacompact.org. Uh, as you can see, the link there for it. And then uh, on that website, you're gonna we have a compact toolkit, which is going to consist of all the materials underneath here. Uh, um, piece of the model legislation, a uh, section by section summary of the model legislation, as well as a reference sheet for legislative testimony and an FAQ section. Uh, you know, if after this uh, presentation, you have any questions or comments, maybe something you want to reach out to us about, feel free to do that um, at the email address down there on the bottom left corner, pacompact 
at csg.org.